Please rise and join in our opening hymn. It's hymn number 126, found in the Blue Hymn Notes. 126.
and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as Cecilia comes forward to proclaim our word.
the Lord Christ. Now, when Jesus had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them, Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Gracious God, may the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts be always pleasing and acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. It is always a gift for me when I get to spend time with the grandkids, whether it's together or one-on-one. -on -one. I really enjoy trying to, to build relationships with them individually as well, and and get to know them as their personalities emerge. And um, you all know that for some of my grandkids from a, a high level, that they have an uphill journey ahead of them. I, I think specifically of Kenna and Grayson Gugutsa, who three years ago lost their mom. But I, I've started a lovely tradition. I'm, I'm grateful to be part of a, a really big village of love around them as they, they navigate life. And uh, started a little tradition with my eight-year-old granddaughter, Kenna, um, I, I'm really intentional about wanting to kind of expose Kenna to all sorts of world-opening possibilities, and also really intentional about trying to expose her to strong women. So one of the things that we've started doing is um, going to Marquette women's basketball games together. Um, I love basketball. I went to Marquette. It's an opportunity for me to introduce her to college life and campuses so she can see that that's a possibility if that's something she might want to do. And, see some strong women on the court playing basketball. So a couple of weeks ago, I had the gift of taking her to a Marquette Villanova basketball game. And before the game, we go out to dinner somewhere, just the two of us. And being a, a good priest, I, I decided to pick an Irish pub. Because what better place to take an eight-year-old to for dinner before a Marquette game? So we went to Flannery's, which is right off of Cathedral Square downtown. And Kenna, who's eight years old, has this profound culinary sense. It's so developed that her first time in an Irish pub, she ordered to eat, you guessed it, spaghetti. <laughs> and she said it was some of the best spaghetti she ever had. Who would have known the Irish had a way with spaghetti? But they do evidently at Flannery's. So the two of us are having dinner together. In the course of the dinner, I, I said to her, I said, Kenna, I'm really thankful that you are, are willing to spend time with me. It means a lot. It's a gift that I'm able to spend this time with you. So thanks for hanging out with me tonight. And then I, I went on to get a little philosophical with her. And I said, you know, Kenna, I'm grateful because there's going to come a time in the near future when hanging out with Papa Jay maybe isn't the coolest thing to do. And she kind of looked at me with a quizzical look on her face. 
on her face and I said, you'll understand this as you get a little bit older, but pretty soon your friends are going to become really important to you and you're going to want to do a lot of things with them. And I said, that's okay. That's part of growing up. I just hope that you have really good friends that support you and believe in you and want the best for you and care for you. And then I said, like your best friend, Matt. And as soon as I said that, she non-verbally got really sad. And she looked down at her plate of spaghetti and began to twirl her pasta. And she said to her spaghetti, not to me, she said, actually, Papa Jay, Maddie and I aren't friends anymore. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. What happened? And she looked at me and she said, Maddie really hurted me. And I said, well, do you want to talk about it? I'm more than willing to talk about it. I, I love you and, and I'm always here. And she said, no, I don't really feel like talking about it. She said, but I have a new friend. There's a new girl in our class and, and we've become best friends. And I really like her because we have lots of fun together and we really love to be nice to each other. I tried to offer her some empathy, and I said, well, I'm really grateful that you have a new friend, because friends are so important in life. And then I said, it must have been sad, though, to lose Manny as your best friend. And she looked up at me, and I could see her, her wheels spinning in her mind, and she said something that just blew me away. She said, actually, Papa Jay, it's more of a relief, because I don't like to be hurt. Here I was trying to expose this eight-year-old to strong women, and I realized in that moment that she has a wisdom in her soul and a, and a strength already when it comes to relationships. I, I hope she's able to carry that with her as she navigates hopefully so much more life ahead of her. But in hearing all of that, as her grandpa, I had a mixture of emotions. First, I was grateful that she trusted me enough to even share that kind of part of her life with me over dinner, even if she didn't want to go into detail about it all. I was also devastated for her, as somebody who loves her fiercely. I was looking at this eight-year-old, and you realize what we all realize. It's like, boy, she's not innocent anymore. She's recognizing just how broken and ineloquent life can be when friends hurt you and relationships unravel. And I just felt sad for all of that, but I also was amazed at her wisdom as she was able to kind of grow through this ineloquent experience and, and not only look at it as an eloquent experience, but, but find it fashioned and formed into a, a deeper sense of purpose as she's coming to learn more deeply what good and healthy, holy friendships should look like in life. Now, as we find ourselves on this third Sunday after the Epiphany, we've been stepping slowly with Jesus as he begins his public ministry. And one of the paradoxes that we see raised is, as Jesus begins in his, his public ministry, this, this ministry that is fueled by this transformative mission that, that is to light the world on fire in a new way, is that that transformative mission and ministry is fashioned out of some of the most ineloquent material. Jesus doesn't come on the scene with a, a smoke machine and a triumphant entry song like some WWE superstar. On the contrary, it's incredibly ineloquent how this all begins. John is now in prison. That seems to have failed in his mission. And how does Jesus respond at the beginning of today's gospel? But again, not by barging onto the scene and taking John's place, but by withdrawing for a while. Now, Matthew couches it in, in language of needing to fulfill scripture because Matthew was primarily writing to a Jewish audience and he wanted to connect the dots between Jesus and their rich and beautiful tradition of Judaism that Jesus lived in and, and died out of. But, but maybe more so than that, this was part of Jesus' humanity once again at play. As he recognized what just happened to his relative John, and maybe he had to withdraw for a while to catch his breath, to get his bearings, to wonder if this is really what he was called to be about in his life and in his ministry. And when he finally kind of emerges from withdrawing and seclusion and begins to surround himself with people, he doesn't catch people with some eloquent, lengthy speech that sweeps them off their feet. No, it's simply a, a come and follow me. And Andrew, Peter, James, and John find themselves following, taking this bold risk on, on not much knowledge at all. 
One could even say that if you're a religious figure and you're trying to start a movement that's going to transform the religious landscape, you wouldn't necessarily want to start with fishermen. They're not the most eloquent in that terms. You would think Jesus would have hung out in some of the more eloquent rabbinical schools and tried to, to persuade some of their great thinkers to get behind him and support him and, and push his movement and mission and ministry. But Jesus had to have some wisdom because if Peter, Andrew, James, and John were tenacious and, and good at finding and catching fish and mending nets, they must be good at finding and catching people and, and mending lives into new creations. But all of this, this, this inaugural ministry is, is made and fashioned out of, out of some of the most ineloquent material when you, when you look at it. And there's a gift in that. There's gospel news in that for you and for me. Because once again, it's a reminder to all of us that, that God doesn't just call the eloquent parts of our lives to be used for building the kingdom. God calls all of our lives, even and especially and even more so, all of the ineloquent and, and foolish pieces of our lives. I mean, that's the mystery that Paul marveled at in today's second reading. Not just what God was able to do through his ineloquence, but what, what God was able to do through the most foolish, most ineloquent experience of all. Utter humiliation on a cross. And how somehow that ineloquent material was able to be fashioned into the most transformative power of our living God. And it's because of that that we're able to experience that same gift in our life, God fashioning transformative purpose and, and meaning and direction out of the most ineloquent parts of our lives. You know, I'm amazed. I, I've been eloquently stumbled for years uh, in, in living in a blended family with stepchildren and add addiction on top of that. And yet, as your priest, I can stand here. I'm, I'm in awe of the ways in which those ineloquent stumbles have actually allowed me into some people's lives to minister to them as a priest in, in amazing and, and, again, humbling ways that, that take away my breath. And I'm sure we can name experiences of that in our own lives. I, I experience it at our men's coffee and conversations at 9 o'clock every Friday morning when sometimes a, a man will step out in some trust and, and bring something to the group only to hear, you know what, I've stumbled and struggled with that too, and here's what I've learned from it, if, if it can be of help to you. And hopefully you can name those experiences in your lives where we, we look at our wounds and our scars and we, we see in them not that, that the struggle or the ineloquence or the wounds or the scars have the last word, but they actually somehow become a source of, of growth and, and wisdom and, and a want to be more compassionate and reach out and walk with others and, and offer some guidance and care and concern precisely because of our own ineloquent stumbles and struggles and the scars we have to show for them. And it's why eight-year-olds are able to see that, that even after a friendship unravels, not only is there life on the other side of that, but there could be a deeper understanding of what good and healthy and holy friendship should look like. It's ultimately why an itinerant Jewish rabbi 2,000 years ago and a, a few ineloquent fishermen were able to start a fire that only bolds more, burns more boldly and brightly, a fire of faith and mission and purpose that we're blessed to be able to gather around today. Amen. We rise and profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from God.
lift those prayers up brought to our attention this past week. Chris asked prayers for her son, who's in the military. Joshua writes, please pray that my rent assistance, assistance comes through and I'm able to stay in my apartment. Stephen writes, pray for healing of a friend, success for a petition, and for stamina and patience for me. Roberta asks prayers for her newborn granddaughter, Eleanor, who had to spend some time in the NICU. David asks prayers for him and his wife. Carol asks prayers for her friend Joyce for relief from pain and a diagnosis that leads to some resolution. Sue asks prayers for her brother-in-law, Mike, who is undergoing workup for esophageal cancer treatment. Also for her sister, Kathy, who needs strength to support Mike through this workup and surgery. Anna writes, can you add my sister-in-law, Kim, to your prayers? She is really struggling with some mental health issues right now. Linda writes, praying for the loss of my dear friend, Ellen. She is now with her love, David, and our Lord. Mary asks prayers for her daughter, who is struggling with addiction and who has lost herself. Mary writes, we were able to talk her into giving us temporary custody of her son, and we hope she starts rehab soon. Dave writes, prayers for my mother, Gloria, as her condition continues to decline and hospice pain medications have begun. Prayers for all those who care for her and for her family. Denise asks continued prayers for Steve as he deals with the news that his brain cancer has spread. Jan prayers for Liz, for B, and for C. Camille asks prayers for Cheryl, who is having surgery on Tuesday. Camille also asks prayers for herself for healing after she fell recently and hurt her arm. And here at St. Luke's, we also hold in our hearts and prayers Mike. Um, who will be having surgery on Tuesday as well for his shoulder. I invite your prayers at this time, either silently or aloud. Hear our prayers, loving God, answer them according to your will, because we made them in faith through your Son, Jesus, Lord, Savior, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to remain standing, to kneel, or to be seated, however you're most comfortable praying. As we confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned.
Now let us walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, in offering and sacrifice to God. Our offertory hymn is hymn number 304 in the blue hymns. 304. <laughs>
And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at, and at the last day, bring us with Luke and all your saints to the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah.
Please remain seated for our prayer after communion. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And you have had us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us down to the world in peace. celebrating a birthday this week. We'd like to bless them. Anybody have a wedding anniversary? Traveling in the bed of blessing? Isabel? Come on up. Travel for fun, for work? Travel for fun. For fun. Awesome. We pray. Loving God, whose glory fills the whole of creation, and whose presence we find wherever we go. Bless and preserve all who travel, especially Isabel. Surround them with your loving care, protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end. For Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we have anybody carrying a weight physically, emotionally, spiritually, would like to celebrate the sacrament of anointing. All right. Couple of announcements. Big one is uh, as uh, we are in halfway through January, we have end of the year giving statements available for those of you who use them for taxes. Um, they're in a box in alphabetical order, just to the right as you leave church today in the gathering space. Um, feel free to pick yours up if you're able to. Anything that's not picked up today will be mailed home this week to everybody. Um, so just want you to know that. Um, I think we have some forward day-by-day -day books left there. If those are devotionals that you happen to use and pray, they're wonderful resources and they're free for anybody to take. Also, um, we'll be having, we're coming up towards the end of January and the beginning of February. It's been our sort of tradition now that the first Sunday of every month we do children's formation after the liturgy, so we'll be doing that on February 5th. If you have littles and they're able to come that day, we're going to be talking about prayer. What is prayer? How do we pray? What are some ways we can practice praying? Why should we practice praying? Um, and as always, while the reflection is going to be geared towards younger parish members, we invite grown-ups, too, to come and share some of their responses to those questions. We'll, we'll gather back up here in the choir space um, after church. Again, that'll be Sunday, February 5th. Um, and just a gratitude for the flexibility, as again, I'm just a reminder, we moved to Zay Prayer to 6.30 on Wednesdays instead of 7, and that seems to be going well. And lastly, y'all are invited downstairs for a coffee hour, immediately following this, and a special thanks personally from my heart um, for all the work that went into the annual meeting last week. I'm glad that's over. Um, I will sometimes wonder why we as Episcopalians stack that right after Christmas, but it's what we do. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit relieved as your priest um, to have all of that behind us, but another successful year and, a, and another year of hope that we're looking forward to, and that's thanks to all of you. Please rise for your blessing. May the Lord be with you to protect you. May the Lord guide you and give you strength. May the Lord watch over you, keep you in his care. And always, always fill your hearts with peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 652 in the movie.